So high flying procedures of femtol ASIC and SMILE, I bring you all down back to surface ablation, which is still safe and effective. I have no financial disclosures to make. Surface ablation, which was the predominant mode of eczema laser treatment, fell out of favor after the advent of LASIK in the 1990s, but has very much resurfaced now and is a very integral part of every refractive surgeon's armamentarium. The prime reasons being the advent of modern flying spot lasers, better understanding of the procedure and limitations, important pharmacological modulations with the appropriate use of mitomycin C and topical steroids, and our increasing knowledge of corneal biomechanics and hydrogenic ectasia. Several methods of performing su surface ablation were devised, and whether we remove the epithelium mechanically, or by using alcohol, or by using an epikeratome, Several studies have shown that there is no significant difference in the final visual outcomes. Looking at PRK itself, comparing the modalities of removing the epithelium, the transepithelial PRK, where the excimer laser itself is used to remove a ring of epithelium, seems to fare better in giving rise to faster reepithelialization, lesser pain scores as compared to the mechanical or the alcohol assisted forms. What made many surgeons move away from PRK in the 1990s was the occurrence of significant post-operative haze in a number of cases. The advent of mitomycin C has greatly reduced this, but some questions remain. When do we use mitomycin C? Aid of mitomycin C has definitely proven beneficial for ablations for more than four diopters, but an increasing number of refractive surgeons use it for all cases of surface ablation. When it comes to the concentration of mitomycin C in a direct head-to-head -head comparison, 0.002% of mitomycin C has proven to be less efficacious as compared to 0.02% especially for higher ablations. 0.04 in an isolated study was found to be better but then the general consensus is, is to stick to the concentration of 0.02%. But when it comes to duration, there really is no particular consensus as what would be the ideal duration. Studies ranging from as little as 12 seconds to 30 seconds to 10 seconds per diopter of ablation right up to 120 seconds have all proven to be efficacious and there really is no data available on any head-to-head -head comparison between different times. Though there were initial concerns about endothelial toxicity with mitomycin C, long-term follow-ups of greater than 5 years with serial specular counts have shown that mitomycin C in its current use is exceedingly safe. How does PRK stand when compared to LASIK? When looking at papers in the pre-2008 era, it said prolonged visual recovery, increased amount of haze, decreased safety, when a greater number of patients lost more than two lines of visual acuity, and it was restricted to less than six diopters of ablation. But with the advent of the modern lasers, larger optical zones with smooth transitional profiles, and the widespread use of mitomycin C, now in the post-2008 period, PRK can even be used for higher diopters of correction. In 6 to 12 diopters of correction, it has been used. And even in this subset of patients, comparing PRK and LASIK, there has been no difference in visual acuity shown beyond the 2 to 4 week post-operative time period. Excellent in comparative safety and accuracy. And comparable results of, uh, in hypropia as well. And definitely a significantly lesser dry eye. The exclusive advantages where PRK can be used is especially in thin corneas with less than 500 microns. Suspect topography, PRK has been shown to have greater biomechanical strength retentivity in the cornea. Extremes of keratometry where you are worried about flap related complications, previous glaucoma surgeries where you don't want to injure the conjunctiva while the docking procedure and definitely in sports and military professionals where you don't want to leave behind a flap. Where PRK comes into a league of its own is when it comes to PRK use in enhancement, the use of topo-guided PRK, and definitely the more recent and controversial PRK extra. When talking about PRK in enhancement, in this large study of 290 eyes, where they compared PRK and flap lift as a modality for enhancement, they had comparable visual results. But the flap lift had an epithelial ingrowth rate of 18.5%. Even though only a few required a repeat intervention, one in five patients had a risk of developing this potentially visually compromising complication. And in another study, it also showed that when the flap lift was performed more than three years after the primary treatment, the risk of epithelial ring growth increased seven times. Definitely PRK, a very good modality for enhancement in such cases. 
Topo-guided PRK is an efficient tool for helping unhappy patients with decentered treatments, enlarged optical zones, low-inch flaps, and definitely in post-PK and post-dial patients with no danger of compromise to the graftose junction, post-RK patients where lifting a flap itself could be a challenge, and definitely, more recently, where it has come into vogue is the use of topo-guided PRK in keratoconus. Where CXL alone can give rise to a stiffening effect, but combining this with a PRK gives rise to more anterior surface normalization, resulting in a better visual acuity. Can be used most commonly in mild to moderate keratoconus with central cones, where we do have a minimal residual thickness of 450 microns, where we uh, restrict the maximum ablation to 50 microns and not beyond the 70% of refractive error, arbitrarily more because you feel that the CXL can cause a flattening effect in, in the future. Showing you some case examples where a patient with minus 4 diopters of 612, after 6 months after that, had a, uh, with just a diopter and a half, improved to 66. Another case example which resulted in much better uncorrected and miscorrected uh, visual acuity, giving rise to significantly better topographic and refractive outcomes. Initially, there was a question whether to do this simultaneously or sequentially, but that has been put to rest with different studies showing that simultaneous treatment is definitely better. If you're doing a sequential treatment after a cross-linking, you're removing the cornea which has already been cross-linked, thereby minimizing the potential benefit of cross-linking. And definitely, if you're doing it sequentially, in a previously cross-linked cornea, the ablation rates could vary, thus making the final uh, visual outcomes quite unpredictable. Moving on to the last but controversial topic of PRK Extra, where cross-linking is now being combined with standard PRK for borderline uh, thickness of corneas, slightly lower pachymetries, certain red flag signs in your ectasia indices in your tomography, lower powers, and especially in retreatments where there is a risk of regression, possibly the CXL could help. How this cross-linking differs from the standard cross-linking is that the total energy is halved to just 2.7 joules and the total irradiation time is only about 90 seconds. Of course, there are certain concerns with the safety of this procedure where we still do not have established cutoffs as to how low we can go in terms of pachymetry. What is the final refractive effect which will be there in such patients? Will there be increased haze and scatter caused by the cross-linking itself? Will there be progressive flattening? Studies to date, though not very long-term follow-ups, have shown good outcomes. A study done at our center of 60 patients with comparable spherical equivalence and comparable age, but only differing in terms of their tomography and their ectasia indices, showing some red flag signs, had comparable PCVA and UCVA at six months, though long-term results are still awaited. Another controversy in this area is to whether you to use mitomycin C or not. Will mitomycin C reduce the effect of cross-linking? Another hypothesis is that cross-linking itself induces apoptosis in the anterior stroma, so possibly leading to less haze. We haven't used mitomycin C in any of our PRK extra patients, and they seem to have done quite well. To sum up, surface ablation remains an important and essential tool in our everyday practice. And with the advent of newer advanced lasers and the use of mitomycin C, it is definitely a safe and effective procedure. Thank you.